Welcome to Matthew's United Methodist Church. My name is Jill Willis, and I am your worship leader. Let me open us up in prayer this morning. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, you have revealed yourself as one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people. In a world that looks away from injustice, you cast your eyes on the destitute, the poor, and the wronged. You have called us to follow you 
to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release for the captives and recovery of sight for the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the time of your blessing. Lord, be present with your church as we respond to your call. Open our eyes, fill us with compassion, lead us to serve others, and give us courage against the face of hatred. And this morning, as we enter into your presence, knowing that your victory is won through the powerlessness of the cross, we pray that your church may be won. Teach us to accept humbly that this unity is a gift of your spirit. In Jesus' name, all of God's people say, Amen. So this weekend, folks, as we recognize Martin Luther King, I wanted to read a quote from his speech in 1957 called, Loving Your Enemies. It says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So let us walk together in the light of Christ. And if you have your candle and you're ready to light it, let's worship together in love.
let's turn our thoughts today to Martin Luther King and recognize that there are ties between us, all oh, men and women living on the earth, ties of hope and love, sister and brother. That we are bound together in our desire to see the world become a place in which our children can grow free and strong. We are bound together by the task that stands before us and the road that lies ahead. We are bound, we are There is a feeling like the clenching of a fist. There is a hunger in the center of the chest. There is a passage through the darkness and the mist. Though the body sleeps, the heart will never rest. Recognize that there are ties between us, all men and women living on the earth, ties of hope and love, sister and brother. Well, good morning to you. I am so glad to be joining you in worship wherever you might be this morning. And I can't help but think about the peacefulness that I feel when I am in worship. Even if I'm not in this building, there are moments all throughout my day where I have the opportunity to experience God's presence. Maybe it's a cool breeze as I'm walking down the street or Sometimes it's even getting a text message from someone that reminds me that I am a child of God. And so today, I encourage you that you might be that reminder of God's love for someone else. That as you're hearing me speak to you right now, that you might ponder and pray in your heart for who God might be nudging you to reach out to today. Maybe that's by text or, or by phone call or even an email. I would encourage you to do this in a special way, that you can let them know that the peace of Christ be upon them. This is an ancient greeting of the Christian church, and it is 
a greeting that unites all of us together as brothers and sisters. And so I encourage you to extend that greeting to someone today. And on behalf of all of us leading you in worship this morning, may the peace of Christ be with you all. May the peace of Christ be with you. 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 And also with you. And you. May the peace of Christ be with 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 you. Again, I welcome you to Matthew's United Methodist Church online worship. My name is Corey Millette, and I am one of the pastors here at Matthews, and I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us online this morning. If you are visiting with us, we extend a special word of welcome to you. If you are a first-time guest with us, I'd like to encourage you to visit the church's website following the worship service and take some time to fill out the guest connection form. Also, for anyone who is watching, if you would like to know more about what is happening in and through the life of ministry here at Matthews, I encourage you to sign up for our celebration newsletter that comes out on Friday through an e-blast. This is a great way to see a comprehensive list of events and announcements of things that are happening here at Matthews. Both the guest connection form and to subscribe to that email can be found under the Connect tab at matthewsumc.org. Also, friends, we want to make sure that you do not miss one moment of worship with us. And so I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to youtube.com slash matthewsumc and set your notifications so that you might know that we are going live for our 9.30 and 11 o'clock worship services. You can share in the comments right there in the chat section, and you can also view us on Facebook. If you haven't done so already, I'd like to encourage you to take some time to check in this morning for our worship service. Put, let us know who's worshiping. You can put it right there in the comments or in the live chat section. Also, you can check in following this morning's worship service through our Sunday morning email that you received. I also want to share with you some special things that are coming up in the life of ministry here at Matthews. The first is that next Sunday, January the 24th, we will be celebrating Scout Sunday. That is always a wonderful Sunday in the life of ministry here, and I know that you join me in being excited for the way that they will lead us in worship next week. Also, we want to make sure that you know that our 2021 Leadership Connection will be held virtually this year on our YouTube page on Saturday, January the 30th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. This event will feature Pastor Chuck and Pastor Paul, along with our Metro District Superintendent, Reverend David Hockett. We encourage all of our church members to join us for this special time together, but especially we encourage those of you who will be serving in elected and lay leadership in 2021 to make a point to attend with us. You can find more information, including the link to get connected to that meeting, on Realm under events or through our church's website. Also, following our leadership connection on Saturday, January the 30th, there will be an administrative council charge conference meeting at 12.30 p.m. via Zoom. The purpose of this meeting will be to review and affirm our church member and friend Jenny Savage as a candidate for ministry in the United Methodist Church. 
Also, during this meeting, it will be time for us to review and approve the 2021 operating budget for Matthews United Methodist Church. You can find the Zoom link to get connected to this meeting on Realm, under events, or on our church's website. We also want to make sure that you are aware that we will begin live streaming worship services again next Sunday on Sunday, January the 24th. At the conclusion of each of our live stream services, the services will be available for you to view at any time. So we will no longer be sharing links for on-demand moving forward. Subscribers to our emails will still receive the Sunday morning invitation where we encourage you to check in online or in the comment fields as you are watching worship with us. We want to make sure that you know that the church office will be closed tomorrow, January the 18th, in observance of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Well, friends, even though we might not all be worshiping together in the same room this morning, I am comforted by the fact that I know that one thing that we can do that unites us all together as brothers and sisters in Christ is that we can unite our prayers as one, that we can bring before God all of the concerns that are on our hearts and minds today, and we can place them in his hands and allow God to continue work in and through our lives. And so at this time, I invite you to join me joining all of our prayers together as we go before God and pray as one body of Christ. So let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we are just so humbled by your presence in our lives. And God, we know that oftentimes, especially when the world just seems just a little bit crazier than normal, God, that sometimes we get consumed by that craziness and we can forget about that incredible presence that you bring to our lives. And so, God, in this moment, in this time of prayer, God, I I pray for a sense of peace, a sense of comfort that would rest upon all of our hearts and minds this day so that the chaos might get just a little bit quieter. And that your voice would speak in the midst of that quiet. And that, Father God, your presence would be made known to us. And that your direction, your guidance, your love, and your grace would show us the way forward. That it would help us to know the ways that you call us to be light in the darkness of this world. God, we know that in the darkness, it can seem lonely. We can feel lost, and we can seem insecure. And God, we certainly don't feel like we have the encouragement we need to persevere and to push through. And so, God, this morning, may your light begin to burn brighter within each of us so that when we find ourselves in the darkness and in the chaos, your light would beam forth from us. And that not only would we be able to feel the comfort of this light, but those around us and those that we encounter and speak to, God, that they would know the comfort of your presence in their life through each of us. And so, Father God, today we pray that you would bring order to the chaos. That from despair and loss that we might be feeling, you would bring life and hope. For God, we know that it is your love, your love that continues to prevail and reign over all things, even when your world looks like they may have forgotten you. And so God... As our prayers unite together on the threshold of a new week, God, we pray that we might grasp the picture that you have for each and every one of us 
in the moments and in the week that lie ahead. God, give us the confidence that we need and let us know that with your love, we can conquer anything that we might encounter. And so, Father God, may you hear these prayers that are on our hearts and minds and those spoken before you this day. And all of God's children said, Amen. Brothers and sisters, God calls us to the unexpected and the extravagant opportunities in our life. These are moments where we can grow in our gifts and in our faith. Holding things close in fear, well, it distracts us from the path of discipleship that I believe that God calls us to. But when we put our full trust in Him, we are able to ooze generosity and joy in our life. And so, friends, because you give, Matthew's United Methodist Church is able to give and support not only those in our local community, but also many others around our world. And so today, if you call Matthew's United Methodist Church your spiritual home, I invite you to gather together your gifts, your tithes, and your special offerings and return them to God in great gratitude and praise through one of our virtual giving opportunities that is available through Realm or our text to give. Of course, you are also welcome to mail your gift here to the church office. And so friends, may we unite our gifts and tithes together in such a way that God's kingdom work can be furthered here on earth. And so I invite you to this morning to give generously.
This morning's scripture comes from James chapter 2, verse 1, and Romans chapter 2, verse 11, and I'm reading from the NRSV version. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in your glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For God shows no partiality. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for worship here at Matthews Methodist on this day. Important weekend, the Martin Luther King holiday. And uh, some of you may remember that every year we've been a part of, um, of sharing in this important holiday, especially this day through a scholarship that we've partnered with other churches right here in the central community of Matthews to present a, a scholarship to a deserving student from the Mount Moriah Church of the Crestdale community. And today we have another one, and I'm so pleased today to introduce to you Faith Smith. So Faith, tell us a little bit about you. My name is Faith Smith. I go to Independence High School. I'm a senior there. I attend Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church. I gave my life to Christ when I was 12 years old. And I think you also heard sometime that you might like what sport? Basketball. I mean, is it? Do you play basketball, or no. you just like to watch? And I like to play? watch it with my dad. We um, are season holder ticket, oh, season ticket holders at the Hornets Arena. Ooh, how great! Gosh, I want to go with you sometime. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you are the recipient this year of the. Martin Luther King Scholarship, so that should help you in your future endeavors. You know, what does this scholarship mean to you? And then what about Dr. King? What does Dr. King and how he speaks to you and speaks to your faith? What does all that mean to you? This scholarship is a blessing to further my education and dream. And Martin Luther King, um, it means encourage it. Encouragement to me because I'm majoring in a male dominant mm -hmm. career. I want to yeah. be a sports reporter or a sports agent, and I know I want to change that, and I know I can do it with this verse, um, Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. That's great. Now, you know, you, you didn't grow up in the time of Dr. King, but Surely you've heard about him. And Multiple times. Yeah, so what does, what does that mean to you? It means that someone that made this much of a difference is worth learning about. And so you've done that, and you will be doing that more and more and more in the future. Well, we yes. are so proud of you. I, I know you want to express your gratitude to your friends at Mount Moriah and to the other persons in that. Take some time and just be able to say thank you to people that are investing in you. Okay. First, I would like to give honor to God, the head of my life, and I would like to thank Pastor Chuck and the members of this church. I would like to thank the scholarship for, committee for choosing me. This is truly a blessing and an honor to me. And I would like to thank my family and my church family who guided me to be the young lady I am today. Oh, that's great, Faith. Boy, what a beautiful witness and testimony. I know your family is so proud of you. Their hearts are just bursting with love for who you are and what you're becoming. And we're grateful you're with us today through Matthews United Methodist. We look forward to all kinds of stories about what God's doing in and through you and how you're continuing the legacy of your family and the incomparable Martin Luther King Jr. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Before we get started today on my message, a couple of things that are coming up in the life of the church that I want you to be aware about. First of all, Coming up next week, uh, next Thursday, between 8 and 2.30 at the Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church, uh, they're doing COVID testing. 
They do that on the third Thursday of each month from 8 to 2.30. I know that I've gone each of the times they've done for testing over the last months. Uh, it's free and it's easy and um, just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. And then secondly, make sure that you put on your calendar our Leadership Connection which is coming up this year on January the 30th, beginning at 10 o'clock, 10 to 12. It will be virtual. You can get that through our YouTube channel. And this year, I'm so excited about introducing our United Methodist District Superintendent to you, Dr. David Hockett. He'll be a part of those times together, and I know you will enjoy uh, learning from him as he talks about what God is doing in the United Methodist Church. Would you pray with me, please? And now, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. And if through the words of mere human person we hear not the voice of God, then speak to each of us in the quietness of her or his own heart. Amen. Would you like to know an unsavory little secret about all of us? Well, it's this. Almost all of us walk around with an unpublished list in our minds of certain kinds of people we tend to like and certain kinds of people that we could do without. We have a list of desirables and a list of undesirables. Now, of course, we don't like to talk about this kind of stuff. I mean, most of us have a hard time admitting to ourselves that, that we have favorites or show partiality to people with whom we interact, but it's true nonetheless. Some among us, if the truth were known, have the same kind of problem that our scripture lessons for this morning are addressing. There are those of us who prefer to be around rich people instead of poor people. In fact, some of us are annoyed by the poor, and if we're honest, we feel superior to them. So we try to insulate ourselves from them as, as much as we can. Others of us, if the truth were known, prefer to be with educated people. We, we, we don't think very highly of those who haven't gotten very far in their academic pursuits. My daughter Mackenzie says, I can be one of those kinds of persons. She has referred to me before as an education snob. Some of us would, would rather be with white-collar people instead of blue-collar people. But interestingly enough, some people prefer to be with blue-collar people, and they have a strong dislike and distrust for anyone who works in a white-collar managerial-type job. Some of us prefer to be around people of a particular generation, and we're generally dismissive of those of another generation. Some people like to be around thin people, and we would rather not associate with those who might weigh a little bit more. And then we get to skin color. There are white people, and then there's everybody else. Some of us have feelings that we wouldn't want to even be made public about where our preferences lie when it comes to skin color. Some of us tell jokes at the expense of certain ethnic groups. We, we say it's just a joke, but there's a reason why we're telling it, and there's a reason why we laugh at the person, the person who tells it. Now, don't kid yourself about this this morning. James chapter 2 verse 1 says that you have your favorite kinds of people and I have mine. Now do you know what James does in chapter 2? Instead of acknowledging that these preferences are acceptable, James says, friends, this stuff must be exposed. This has to be repented of. This has to be transformed from the inside by the love of God. 
Now, James would also say that this subject is very close to the heart of God. In Romans chapter 2, verse 11, we read, With God there is no partiality. James would say that this is serious business because tolerating favoritism and prejudice and bias, well, friends, it could just split churches right down the middle. It causes fights in schools. It's, it's the root of shootings in a grocery store parking lot, and it can be a part of the causes of an attack on our nation's capital. Friends, this stuff has to be rooted out of my heart and out of yours, and today would be a good time for us to begin that uprooting process. Many of the attackers on our nation's capital last week claimed, quite literally, the banner of Jesus. They they displayed flags that said, Jesus 2020, and signs that said, Jesus saves, right alongside banners, the the Confederate flag, and a hanging gallows with a noose. It was not only a moral failure at work on display, but that, my friends, it was such a huge distortion of the good news gospel of Jesus. Jesus is not some presidential candidate or a symbol of a purified, divinely blessed America. Jesus is the risen and living Lord of all. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the salvation that Jesus offers is not the success of your political candidate or the realization of your national dream. It is the forgiveness of sinners. It is the release of the captives. It is the healing of the sick. It is justice for the poor. It is the resurrection of the dead. Oh yes, Jesus is victor, and we may humbly hope to be more than conquerors through him, but friends, let's not forget today that his victory began with scandalous shame of a manger, and that it ended with the seeming defeat of the cross. I had the privilege of doing a sabbatical a few years back, and one of the things that Karen and I did was visit many of the historic sites of the civil rights movement. We traveled from Atlanta to Tuskegee to uh, to Montgomery to uh, to a host of other places like uh, like Selma and then Birmingham and then Memphis and Nashville and uh, Greensboro and finally Washington D.C. During our journey, I did some research on the origins of prejudice. Now, do you know where the fault lies when it comes to prejudice most of the time? You know this. It's home. I mean, if children grow up in a home where a mom or a dad berate people because of their skin color and their ethnicity or their gender or their socioeconomic status or their belief system, then there is a strong possibility that children are going to catch that kind of prejudicial spirit. They're going to carry it in their hearts, and the research shows that the intensity of prejudice can increase from one generation to the next. The second source of prejudice, peer groups. I mean, this is learned primarily in middle, high, and high school. I mean, peer pressure is usually strong enough at that age to motivate kids to say and to do things they would never do on their own. Researchers also say that once the poison of prejudice and partiality, once it gets into your system, there's almost no human way to get it out. In fact, it tends to get worse throughout the course of one's lifetime. Therefore, What it takes is something transformational to root prejudice and partiality and racism right out of us. When Jesus started his teaching ministry, he seized every opportunity he could to expose and to transform the hearts of people with these kinds of discrimination issues. I mean, Jesus went after this kind of stuff like a heat-seeking missile. 
Remember the story in the Bible from the book of Mark, Mark chapter 3, where the religious leaders were uh, becoming jealous of Jesus' growing popularity. And they decided that they needed to come up with a plan to discredit Jesus in a public setting. And the only place that they thought that he might be vulnerable was in regard to the Sabbath day and the observance of the Sabbath day. Now, the Tenth Commandment, you'll remember, stated that one should not work on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees had made up a bunch of these extra-biblical laws about working on the Sabbath. Now, the laws were largely ridiculous, but people had to obey these laws, and the Pharisees thought that they might be able to catch Jesus not obeying one of them. All they needed was just one. So... They hatched a plan. Remember it? Some Pharisees invited Jesus to give a talk in a certain synagogue on the Sabbath day. And now the plan was is that another group would go and they would find a man with a physical disability. And they would sit him right in the front row in the hopes that Jesus would heal the man. And if Jesus healed the man then it would be an exertion of energy as, as if he had been working, and then the Pharisees would be able to discredit him. Friends, it was a huge sting operation. And so the Pharisees found a man with a withered arm. And they brought him into the meeting. And Jesus shows up at the meeting, and he stands up to give his talk. And when he does, he sees this man with the withered arm sitting right in front of him. And then he sees the rest of the crowd packed with religious leaders who were leaning forward. And they're looking at the man with the withered arm. Now friends, it is as if the religious leaders are saying, come on Jesus, heal him. And if you do then we're going to slam dunk you with a Sabbath law violation. Now the Bible records that Jesus sizes this whole thing up and he grieves to his very core over the hardness of their hearts. And do you know what Jesus realized in that moment? He realized that all of these religious people, they didn't care about the man with the withered arm. They didn't care about his life. They didn't care about his arm. They didn't care about his future. They were just using him. Jesus saw the hardness of their hearts. Jesus knew what it was going to cost him to heal the man. And so he asked him to stand up and he healed him right on the spot. And everybody jumped up. Do you know what they said? Sabbath day violation. You just violated the Sabbath. Now what was Jesus really doing? I mean, why did Jesus heal the man when he knew it was going to cost him so much? You know, Jesus was saying there that anyone with a disability matters. You don't embarrass someone who has physical struggles. You don't use them and you don't show them a lack of respect. You show them the respect and the kindness and the courtesy and the love because persons, friends with any kind of disability, be it physical or intellectual, they matter. On another occasion, Jesus and his disciples were traveling. It was a hot, dusty trip, and they're all thirsty and hungry. And so they stop at a well, and the disciples leave for some errands. But Jesus strikes up a conversation with a woman. And she came to draw water at the very well that Jesus was refreshing himself from. Jesus not only takes this woman seriously, but he spends a long time in deep conversation with her. And you remember Jesus eventually ushers her into a whole new life, a life filled with the love of God. And so when the disciples return, they notice Jesus is in this conversation with this woman, and they're dumbfounded. And later, Jesus says to the disciples, you know what? That woman... She's important. She really matters. 
Did you know that today there's still large segments of our world that discount and diminish the value of women? Religious favoritism, that's another one of the scariest forms of prejudice. I mean, Jesus talked about this one day, and it's recorded in the book of Luke. Jesus happens to be in a public place, and he's having conversations with people that are far from God, and the religious leaders, they come along, and they show spiritual discrimination. They look down their noses at the people that Jesus is talking to, and then they look down their noses at Jesus because he's hanging out with these people, and they start murmuring to themselves, how could you, the Son of God, have anything to do with riffraff like that? And Jesus turns and he hears what they're saying, and then he tells not one, not two, but three stories. You know, it's the only time in his ministry that he tells three stories in response to what he's hearing. Three stories from Luke chapter 15 to say about who matters to God. Fred Craddock was a preaching professor of mine at Emory University where I I did my doctoral studies. And he tells a story about flying back to Atlanta from Loma Linda, California. He had been there visiting a hospital and a a church of Seventh-day Adventists, and he said, I'd been invited to spend several days there, and I had a great time, and I was on my way home, and I was seated next to a woman who was on her way to Atlanta. And so I said to her, are you on your way home? She said, no, I used to live there, but, but I'm on my way back to see my grandkids. You headed for home? Atlanta? I said, yes. She said, well, what were you doing in California? And I said, well, I was at Loma Linda University in the medical center there. And she said, that's that Seventh-day Adventist place, isn't it? I said, yes, it is. She said, are you Seventh-day Adventist? I said, no, no, but they invited me. You went to the Seventh-day Adventist place and you're not Seventh-day Adventist? She said, no. But they invited me to come, and I had a great time. She said, I know what you're doing. And I said, what? She said, you were othering. I said, I was? Yes, you were othering. I said, what's othering? She said, my preacher preaches on it just about every Sunday. He says, we need to do more othering. And what he means was, we need to get acquainted with people that are different than you are. You know, establish friendships, share in work and prayer and praise and everything together. Other people, the other. Get acquainted with and deal with the other. She said, he calls it othering. And he preaches on it every Sunday. I am so sick of him talking about othering. It's just a fad. Well, she got all bothered about it. I'll be glad when it passes. It's just a fad. If he says one more word about othering, I'm going to throw up right then and there in that church. I said, it's not a fad. She said, it is a fad. Look here. And so she opened up the Sky magazine, the airline magazine, and and, and there was an article there in English and in Spanish and in Japanese. And she said, now look a there. The airline thinks they are othering. A few years ago, it would have just been in English, and we'll get back to just having it in English. I said, no. It's not just a fad, why it's as old as Christianity. She said, what do you mean? Well, I said, well, when Jesus died, Pilate put a big sign on the cross that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And it was written in Hebrew and Latin and Greek. And that woman didn't say another word. Fred Craddock said, I hated to pull my Bible card 
but she was beginning to get on my nerves. I love the way the great Catholic journalist Dorothy Day once put it. She said, I really only love God as much as the person I love least. You know, all this week I have been sensing in my heart God saying to me, Chuck, you have never looked into the eyes of someone who doesn't matter to me. Why, every time, Chuck, you make eye contact with the person in the, in the line in the restaurant drive through you know, the checkout person at Publix, a wealthy business person, a grandparent in a nursing home, street person, a person of another skin color, an LGBTQIA person, an illegal immigrant, a person who votes the opposite way that I might vote, every one of those others that you lock eyes with, Chuck, did you know they matter to me? All of them, Chuck, are someone for whom my son died. They deserve your respect, and they deserve your kindness, and they deserve your love. In the final hours of Jesus' life, he was hanging on a cross between two thieves. And one of the thieves realizes that Jesus is about to breathe his last breath. And so he reviews his life, and he's just sick about how he has lived, but it's too late. What's he going to do now? I mean, he can't clean up his act. He can't decide to just fly straight. He can't just join a church. He can't offer God anything except a heart that is filled with remorse. And all of a sudden, this fantastic thought leaps into his mind just for a fleeting moment. And he wonders to himself, what if the love of God is so high and so deep and so wide and so all-encompassing that God could wrap God's arms around a complete mess up like me? What if someone like me, after all that I've done, what if I still matter? So he turns to Jesus and says, Do you think there would be a chance that you'd remember someone like me when you come into your kingdom? Remember what Jesus said? Today you will be with me in paradise. You know, friends, it's, it's as if Jesus is saying, in spite of all that you've done, you still matter to me. You have mattered to me since the day you were born. You have mattered to me when you were headed in the wrong way. You have mattered to me when you did your first theft. You mattered to me when you got arrested the first time. And you mattered to me the day that you were condemned to die. There has never been a moment when you stopped mattering to me. And on the basis of your humility and your faith, I say to you, welcome home. Now friends, that picture, that picture of love should melt you all the way to your very core. Did you know that was the vision of a dreamer by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. You remember he even gave it a name. Remember what he called it? It was the Beloved Community. In the 1960s, the Beloved Community was met with violence. And regrettably, the same thing happens today. But ultimately, the beloved community will come, the kingdom will come, and God's will will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. Oh, I know. It's crazy. 
It's nonsensical. It's illogical. It's counterintuitive. It's scandalous. Maybe you might even describe it as subversive. That a community, when filled with a love like that, when it takes root in your heart, it'll change the way you look at people. And it, it'll motivate us to be the first to reach our hands out, to do some othering. Some othering to those whom we once might have diminished, maybe disparaged, disrespected. And then we'll be the first to say, you know, you matter to God. And because you matter to God, you matter to me. Would you bow your heads? Now this morning, just there in the quietness of your heart, I want to invite you to just take a few moments of quiet and to, and to pray for whatever need that might be upon your heart. And perhaps what's on your heart this morning has to do with, with some of the things that we've been talking about this morning. Maybe, maybe, maybe you've diminished people. Maybe, maybe you've disrespected others or spoken with other persons that are different from you. People that are from a different part of the country or something along those lines. And maybe you, a different perspective, whatever it might be. But today is the time to just offer that to God. God wants you, God wants me to repent this morning of that stuff and to start anew. And God wants us today to begin to take some action steps. Some actions, some steps of othering. To get beyond and outside of our little circle and to reach beyond that to others. Oh God, this day, empower us to do so. And now just in the quietness of your heart, take a few moments and offer all of that to God. Things 
a possible There's no broken body you can't raise No soul that you can't save All things are possible The darkest night You can light it up You can light it up Now, friends, as you um, go forth into the world this day, from the, maybe your, um, your dining room table, maybe it's your kitchen table, maybe it's your desk, maybe you're just sitting on the couch with your family, however it might be that you enter into the world today to do some othering, may the courage of the early morning's dawning, and the strength of the eternal hills, and the peace of the evening's ending in God's joy, which the world cannot give and which the world cannot take away, be with you today and tomorrow and in all life's tomorrows. Amen and amen. Go in peace.